whatever. And, and then we will open it up for discussion. And um, you can have any ask questions as you wish. And uh, the plan is to end by six. Dr. Philip Bell is the Shaughnessy Larson Endowed Chair and Professor of the Learning Sciences and Human Development at the University of Washington. He also is the Executive Director of the UW Institute for Science and Math Edu Education. His earliest passion is technology and he received his bachelor's degree in engineering and computer science from UC Boulder with an emphasis on cognitive science and artificial intelligence. He then spent five years as a software engineer, and that was where he discovered his interest in education. He was part of a group working on an NSF grant that developed multifunctional sensors and then used those sensors to do research with local sixth grade students. When he decided to go back to graduate school, he chose UC Berkeley, where he was able to combine his interest in cognitive science, education, and technology by pursuing a PhD in education in cognitive or human cognition and development. As you can see from the title of his presentation, Dr. Bell's research interests span across diverse environments that focus on how people learn in ways that are significant to them. Some of these interests include culturally expansive curriculum instruction, research guided innovative learning technologies, and empirical research methods for studying education and learning especially design-based research in education and ethnography and learning. When he gets some free time in between all of these projects, Phil likes to load up the whole family and the dog into the car and go for marathon road trips, hiking, camping, and backpacking his way around the country. <laughs> Phil has a goal of making the exploration of science a joyful experience for children that can help to open future pathways. Occasionally, he even engages students by showcasing his talents in juggling, Literally, not just figuratively, which I think is an impressive display for children of all ages. We are excited and honored to have Phil here to share his research with all of us. Please join us in giving Phil a warm welcome. Um, so, um, uh, it's an honor to be here, thank you so much um, for the invitation to come and think with you. I really am like just um, working on a set of uh, puzzles on my table uh, in our partnerships and I kind of want to think with you about those and like what we've learned and what we're still working towards. Um, I, I was not um, trained to do a lot of the daily stuff that I do. Uh, like, so I run an institute um, so like, um, parallel to Crimsey and, and its size, um, and, you know, there's a lot that goes into just managing an organization. Uh, I, I wasn't um, prepared to work across school systems, like in partnership with districts for multiple years, uh, giving the ebbs and flows of, of all of that to your work. Um, but some of what I was trained for, you'll see finding its way into that, into that work. And I really um, encourage kind of a, a, a back and forth throughout the, the session here if you um, have questions or thoughts. And there'll be a couple of moments where we stop and actually do some, some small group pieces um, with um, people that are near you. So here we are. Um, we have a new vision for K-12 science education. Uh, that also includes pretty significant components of engineering, design. We have the resulting next generation science standards that are in play. Um, kind of 3D instruction is formally in place around 60 to 70% of youth in the country, um, and even more broadly, in places that are talking about adopting new standards are pretty routinely, from what I've uh, been tracking, thinking about 3D. Um, sorts of approaches, and uh, for those of you not in science ed, like thinking about the, the epistemic practices of science and engineering, the different core ideas that show up within a particular field, and the cross cutting concepts that show up across, are these three dimensions that now define the learning performances that we care about. The point here is really to say, like, so we have a vision, and we have a 
you know, a few hundred pages here, and we have like another thousand pages from the National Academies, from uh, other reports to try to give guidance about how to think about this work, but we still don't know how to do a lot of it on the ground, actually. So we have to like figure out like how to develop implementation of the vision, which includes building on what we do know how to do, but then realizing that there's new work to figure out, um, and we need to really develop implementation in a very active way. These documents should travel the world together if you're in discussions and they're talking about implementing NGSS and they're not referencing the framework, then that's actually a problem um, because a lot of the underlying rationale and thinking is in the, the volume on the left. Um, so that's just one of those things that we need to... Uh, there's a lot, lots of layers around that particular strategy um, that was put in play, but like, those two work documents should be used together when they can be. Um, I'm a design designer. Uh, engineering was my first home. Um, designing and building was one of my first passions. And so this is a, a designer, Donald Caduto, talking about the most important thing is to keep the most important thing the most important thing. <laughs> um, in this particular space, as I think about standards and the, the opportunity and the perils attached to standards, uh, the equity play is the thing um, that's most important in that space. Um, and so it's an ongoing thing. I'm not going to read the quote to you, but I'm going to stop and pause and just let you um, take in at least how the framework was uh, framing the work of uh, equity um, within the vision, and then we'll, we'll keep diving in. Particular issues lined up, system complexities to figure out how to realize this in practice. I think what we're hoping to see are moments of classroom life where kids are engaged in sustained investigations, perhaps around understanding a natural phenomena, perhaps around doing some engineering design work that uh, relates to natural phenomena. Um, and in the process, they're developing a deep conceptual understanding of the disparate core ideas and these cross cutting concepts. Um, and so, like, with that as a frame, um, it's important, you know, part of my history is to think about learning across settings and the ethnographies that we did as part of our life center work where we looked at learning in formal, in formal environments was to understand the broad ecologies of learning that were present um, in the community. And so, in that space, trying to not just center in on classroom life, but also thinking about family life and community life in online spaces and designed in formal environments um, of a broad variety. Uh, and then the programs that um, uh, people experience in that design way. It can be more school-like at moments or less school-like at moments. So we are trying to think about this as a shared vision across these particular settings and locations where there is an opportunity to do intentional design work um, because we know that complex subject matter is learned across places um, over long periods of time with redundant support. And so with that as a frame, um, we all be talking almost primarily about schooling today, but there was a broader set of conversations about connecting um, and so very informal and informal um, environments. So I'm going to come into this uh, thinking about education as a complex dynamic system. Um, this is not, this is an actual uh, diagram, but not one from our work, um, but it's emblematic, I think, to get some of the idea of the complexity on the table, and I'll add a little bit to that and then I'll start um, working with it. Um, you have multiple actors uh, in different levels of, uh, of kind of different um, organizations within the, uh, the system with different routines um, or improvised routines in some cases trying to accommodate their work, manage their work. There are different kinds of infrastructures that get used and that will be a big part of what I talk about today are these infrastructures, where they come from, what we can do with them. Uh, and we need ongoing work around coherence and equity across um, these dynamic um, sorts of evolving systems. And I'll argue that co-design um, among researchers and practitioners in broad ways can actually be very generative spaces for cultivating that work. Um, and I'll kind of share some of the work we've been doing using an open uh, ed resource um, strategy. To put a little bit of texture on that system, um, as I've kind of done versions of a talk about NGSS and framework over the last several years, I've kind of rounded out this list of different sectors and contexts that relate to science ed. And so I'll just let you scan to get a sense. And you might think about the work that you do and 
which of these sectors are in play for the work that you do, um, and which ones might be in play um, for you. And I'm always always trying to refine the list. So like typically, like every so often, like oh you missed that, does that? Um, I'd love to hear about that. So I also teach a lot of research methods courses um, in our college, and um, I have this exercise where people are uh, at different points basically visualizing their study in some way, and that can take many different forms, and so I decided to engage in this work myself to model what it might look like. And so this is what I came up with for our district level study, um, to give a sense of what it feels like, what it seems to act like. Um, so you have, you do have a knotted set of work in the middle that's unfolding, and there, but there are lots of different dimensions of uh, the world that are pulling on it, and, and there is no real center. It's always dynamic, like it is. It does have, um, you know, Angerson's work, and I'll talk about it a little bit later. And it does have this feel of a decentered system of loosely coupled people trying to figure out how to do things together um, for all sorts of different reasons. And you're trying to do coherent equity work, kind of in that space. We've been funded uh, by the National Science Foundation for the past uh, year at this point to try to work across different. Um, states in the country around implementing um, science education from this coherent equity frame. This is a partnership uh, with CU Boulder and Bill Pennell's team there, um, and the Council of State Science Supervisors. So these are, at, at every state level agency, there's somebody in charge of science ed, and um, we partner with them from the 50 states and the territories and DC to try to think with them about what could be useful to engage in the work that they do. Um, and we have 13 states that are partnered directly with us to do co-design work and needs assessment, which I'll talk more about. As we think about organizing for equity and coherence in that kind of system, we have kind of three planks that we kind of open up. The first is promoting equity, so expanding access um, to opportunities to engage in learning as something that we, we think hard about um, across our systems. And then sharing and building capacity around inclusive instructional practices as a secondary uh, strategy. The second plank is around crafting coherence, very much in a sense of like you have a knotted web of activity and you're trying to figure out like how to get that new teacher evaluation system to coordinate with this vision of three-dimensional learning and like what does that look like to actually figure out how to get those things to coordinate with each other. And uh, two important ideas that come from the framework and the literature behind it uh, building a shared vision for science teaching across different parts of the system. Um, that's the vertical coherence idea with some developmental K-12, grade band coherence to it. Um, and then bringing key uh, components into alignment across curriculum assessment, pre-service, instruction. Like how do we actually do that horizontal coherence um, craft? And then the third piece is to realize that you have people engaged in uh, complicated work involving networks of other people that have other interests and routines. And so uh, very much use kind of this, this um, framing of organizing the work together um, in the sense of political organizing to figure out how do we arrange for the work, build a distributed team, kind of a, a network that expands a state, and then think about how do we share tools and strategies that serve the work that they do across that, that space. Uh, within this particular project, then we have a network of networks, right? So we're kind of doing network of network improvement um, through the, the collaboration uh, with the state science. We have a material resource uh, strategy which um, has been up and going for about two and a half years called stemteachingtools.org. Um, and we have about 50 tools posted and a couple of um, full PD OER sessions and other resources there. Um, and when we started, we were getting a lot of pushback from researchers thinking that kind of this idea of a practice brief would not be useful. Um, these are the examples that you have at your table. I gave you two. We'll just stop and look at those in just a minute. Most of the collection of tools are one-pagers that link off to underlying resources and tools. So you can kind of take it as far as you want to go, but to fit the life of a practitioner, the one-page practice brief centered around a problem of practice or an opportunity for practice that is like opening up that issue, um, talking about what different stakeholders might do around that issue, how to engage and work around that, um, and how to think about equity issues, uh, was the genre that we, we um, picked up and started running with. And we've had hundreds of thousands of uses of these tools in the last two and a half years. Uh, you know, I think without having a formal uh, 
marketing campaign, I think we get about 10,000 users um, per month, about two thirds of them are new, coming to explore the collection. And, you know, it, uh, our one liner is that uh, you've already paid for these, they're, they're you know, taxpayer dollar, dollars hard work, right? These are NSF funded. Uh, so we're trying to bundle up our best thinking around a problem practice to try to resource practitioners using at least this particular strategy to some degree. So we have collections of different kinds. We've been working for the last two years around formative assessment. We have a dozen different tools to bring people into capacity building on 3D formative assessment. You can see some of that today. We also have guidance about implementing through professional development and across districts. Um, and we're trying to like build out tools based on um, research studies and knowledge from practice about how to engage in that work. Uh, and there is a range of different thematic categories that we're building out. We are uh, currently building out a collection around climate science teaching. Specifically, we have initiatives and curriculum work in that direction, so that will be added soon. So the broader uh, collection is there, and uh, the, the short half pager gives you a sense of what that initiative is about. Um, and we're interested in <coughs> feedback and uh, other ideas about what tools are missing to actually um, fit problems of practice. So a big part of what we do when we go to a professional conference like NSTA, with science, we try to surface like what is it that would be useful to practice writ large so we can think about tool development in, in relation to those um, pressure points. All right, so today I um, have a few things planned. I'll give a sense of how the framework gives us uh, a lever to think about equity through kind of the cultural turn on learning, um, which we now can actually use in a consensus-like way to say we know that learning involves um, cultural uh, dimensions, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. I'll give a quick overview of design research partnerships as a strategy to get researchers and practitioners uh, working around pressing needs of practice. And then I'll show three examples um, just to get some of the work on the table. One is around curriculum level work, at, um, curriculum development work at district level, uh, around uh, designing for expansive learning. Uh, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about how to think about uh, infrastructuring a district around assessment, and then how do you co-design resources for these broader uses across uh, different state contexts, just to give you a sense of, of what we're up to. I'll then um, close by talking about a conceptual model um, that I've been developing over the last uh, year or so, uh, year and a half, about um, just the nature of research practice community partnerships as a thing. Um, so how is it that we think about the different dimensions of that work and the, the way we, in principled ways, um, organize um, for that partnership work um, for educational improvement. So here are the takeaways. Um, so if you're trying to like figure out what you should be thinking about and uh, maybe uh, taking away from today, um, I'll argue that there's significant work needed just to develop implementation. I've kind of made that point once and I'll kind of come back to show you why that's the case through the examples. Um, implementing standards should be centered on the equity, social justice um, potential around them, and that the cultural turn provides a powerful lever that we should figure out how to bring throughout networks of uh, educators and the school system. Sustained collaborative design research partnerships are a promising approach, and I'll, I'll point to some of the current work that we're up to, but also the underlying research pieces that, and that co-design in particular as a practice um, opens up spaces for improvement um, that are powerful. And then I'll, I'll close by just, also, well, I'll also signal that um, in this work, like, uh, part of the scaling models that have been problematic uh, haven't involved practitioners in the work early enough as we set R&D agendas, and researchers haven't stayed in the game long enough to figure out how things go across systems. Um, and actually you know, take root over years. And so I think I'll make an argument that more of us need to be doing that work while practitioners should be brought in um, in meaningful ways into helping set the research agendas um, that relate to the development of it. All right, so with that is the game plan. I'm gonna say a little bit about taking the cultural turn. Um, you know, one of the things that comes up with NRC consensus documents, because they are consensus documents, um, all people at the table um, have to come to consensus to say those ideas are things that we, we think we have strong evidence for, is that they tend to feel as conservative documents, right? Because they're not at the edge of the field. Um, so like some of you might say, well, yeah, we've kind of known that for a while. And it's, it's true um, that the fundamental cultural nature of learning is a well-established thing, um, but now we have it in national level policy documents that we now get to think about how do we bring that across system. So it's 
It's new in the sense that we now have greater opportunity to do broader work around some of the ideas that I think um, a lot of us care about. So um, I served on the framework committee. I worked um, heavily on the equity and diversity chapter. This is the rough outline for that chapter. Uh, I talk a lot about the need to equalize opportunities to learn, uh, inclusive science instruction, which I'll come back to in just a second, uh, making diversity uh, visible within scientific fields and also within science education, and that the need, there's the need to value multiple modes of expression so we understand what learners are thinking and learning and attempting to express as they engage in their learning experiences. The inclusive science instruction um, portion of that chapter is the largest portion, and it opens up a set of related ideas uh, around this cultural turn piece, so that science learning itself is a cultural accomplishment. We need to um, figure out ways of relating youth discourses to scientific <coughs> discourses. We need to build on prior interests and identity. So at some level, we talk about the 3D learning that's in the new vision, but actually we should be talking about 5D, actually. We, um, we need interest and identity to put in play, in play around um, the three-dimensional view. If you look at the NRC document closely, wherever the three dimensions get opened up, interest and identity get talked about right after that. So the, the committee felt it was too much to ask for a five-dimensional view of learning. We probably all agree that maybe that would be a complicated thing to navigate, um, but we did <coughs> want to hold on to interest and identity um, as fundamental concepts for uh, learning. And then leveraging uh, students and communities cultural funds of knowledge um, to kind of uh, orient learning to the local um, to what uh, matters um, and the histories and interests that uh, reside within the community. So the framework um, asserts that all science learning can be understood as a cultural accomplishment, what counts as learning and what types of knowledge are seen as important are closely tied to the community's values and what is useful in that community context. It opens up then a set of um, details of uh, variability of cultural life and how that shapes science learning and opportunities to engage in science learning and different phenomena that are present in different uh, lives and that kind of thing. Uh, trying to like understand just the, you know, I think with the How People Learn volume in 1999 in particular, the cognitive view of learning got broadly um, brought into education. And I think we're in a similar moment now to have kind of a cultural dimension of learning in relation to the cognitive um, to be kind of the next capacity building uh, focus for the field. And when we kind of open up this concept with um, researchers and educators, uh, we try to do some work around the word culture itself. It's not a term that people necessarily know in the scientific literature sense. Um, so it's not a trait that some people have and others don't have. Um, we're all cultural beings based on the communities we participate in and the value systems that we operate uh, within and that kind of thing. Culture includes the ways in which human beings engage and make sense of the world and participate in the everyday lives of our communities. And it, those are socially and historically organized ways of making sense of the world. And we can refer to those as sense-making repertoires and like think about for learners and communities, what are the repertoires that they bring to a particular moment and how do we build from there in relation to the purposes of learning and science. And, um, leading equity issue with this transition is that the cultural worlds of youth from non-dominant communities are often viewed from a deficit frame rather than adding to increase rigor and relevance in the science learning experience itself. So trying to figure out how do we kind of uh, round that corner to understand the asset-based nature of the cultural variety um, that's present within the communities in which we're doing our work. So that's the, the through line of that. To get a little bit more specific, um, everyday experiences provide a rich base of knowledge and experience in support of conceptual change in science. And we have a lot of work done. I know, I know um, Beth Warren and Megan Bang were here in 2012 and opened up a set of these ideas as well. Um, and I think as we think about what is um, culturally variable in the lives of youth and communities that we might care about as science educators, uh, is how they experience, observe, and narrate phenomena, how they communicate with each other, how they view elders, the role of elder knowledge in their system, how they pose questions, engage in argumentative explanatory talk, how they engage in writing, how familiar they are with design activities in their lives and working through failure as an endemic part of design, and just the salience and, uh, of an interest in specific topics. So there's just a handful of ways in which culture matters in relation to science learning um, that matters. So we're trying to like do that work. 
we, we talk in our group, we have a design principle for our, our pieces that have to do with overlapping curriculum with the lives of youth. It's a metaphor that Ray McDermott um, put in play a while ago, where you kind of think about like the work of like, shouldn't school be overlapped with the lives of students and communities to the degree as possible, at least more than it often is. And that opens up opportunity to do culturally responsive instructional work uh, and in the framework that gets opened up. Um, to think about how to organize science learning in relation to community practices and knowledge. Um, when we engage with educators around this topic, we're doing curriculum work, we'll stop and pause, think of a community and a science topic and try to do work around the intersection, intersection of those two um, pieces. Um, and there are strategies that we actually use using cameras and different things to actually document everyday life in a particular community to actually inform directly the dynamic cultural system that surrounds a topic, um, and we kind of build capacity for doing that kind of work. All right, so we're going to uh, do some turn and talk here around the um, the two briefs that I brought. Um, so um, find STEM Teaching Tool 27 and 11, and uh, do quick introductions with your elbow partner if you don't know them. Groups of two or three work best here. Read the front page of each of the briefs. And then as a group, select one or the other and sink in and read the whole brief and have a discussion about it. So some discussion questions in the back. Right. Um, uh, but because both those things are being 
coined in 2011, uh, Anne Brown in the 90s as she was writing about design experimentation, had it in, you can see it in her, her writing as well, she just didn't call it out. I had the pleasure of having two graduate courses with Anne when I was a graduate student, and one of them was about understanding system level engagement. She was building towards that because she saw what had happened with reciprocal teaching when researchers did not stay engaged and it started traveling. And so like, I think she came to realize like, oh, we need to keep figuring out like how to do improvement in relation to kind of coherence of the ideas, like conceptual coherence. Design research partnerships, um, this uh, WT grant report from 2013 uh, from Cynthia Coburn, Bill Penuel, and Guile like open up three different models of um, partnerships, design research partnership being one variety, um, and well, the slides will be available so you don't have to scribble the URLs if you don't want to. Uh, these are long-term collaborations between practitioners and researchers organized to investigate problems of practice that help on system um, outcomes that we care about. And it, it, they're built to leverage the distributed expertise of who comes into that work through a co-design model to make progress on these negotiated goals. So that's the kernel of the idea. They are place-based, they're across the district, they're in a particular region, they have kind of a centrality to them in that way, because people are working together in concert, um, and co-design and, and testing strategies that improve teaching and learning, but also contribute generalized knowledge about teaching and learning across systems. Those are dual goals in the work, and research and practitioners do this work um, throughout. So just to kind of have a, a visual for this, you integrate research practice, and in some cases, community perspectives, to co-design, test, refine, and adapt in iterative ways. Um, tools, routines, contexts of different kinds. People do, they build different things. Embedded in educational improvement efforts in this ongoing way, and those can also take place in a variety of places. Um, so it's a general methodological approach that does improvement work um, through this design uh, partnership model. Uh, Bill and colleagues in 2011 wrote an ER piece that laid out the four principles for DDIR. Teams form around a focus on persistent problems of practice from multiple stakeholder perspectives. I've amended that a bit in our thinking to think about opportunities for improvement in practice as well. Not everything is a problem, like there are just good opportunities lots of center on. Um, to improve practice, teams commit to iterative collaborative design. Uh, to promote quality in the, the R&D process, teams develop theory related to both classroom learning and implementation. So you're working kind of in organizational theory levels and teaching and learning theory levels um, through a, some form of disciplinary inquiry. And you're fundamentally concerned with building capacity to do ongoing improvement work. So you might come up with a great solution at the moment. Like, so we just spent a year in our district building curriculum uh, adaptations for a particular curriculum, and I just learned Two weeks ago, that we're moving to a different curriculum next year. <laughs> this is not an uncommon district phenomenon, um, but now the opportunity is like so. We built human capacity to that curriculum, so we're leveraging that, and we'll, some of the particular pieces may hold with us, but probably not too much. And so we're kind of starting in again um, using the capacity of the equity. This is an ongoing thing, right? So the part of the strategy in the framework in the informal volume that I was part of at the NRC in DBIR is to like foreground the equity dimensions and also embed them throughout. Like it's kind of a, a pull out and embed strategy. Um, and within DBIR, um, this is being operationalized around notions of inclusion, participation in the learning experiences, attention to cultural difference, disrupting problematic practices that have become rooted in normative ways that need to be desettled, uh, focus on opportunities to learn uh, instrumentally and in situations do work of restorative justice in relation to the communities, in relation to schooling, and what um, should be in place um, for those communities. So this is um, part of the work and it shows up differently based on the particulars of the project. DBIR it has a family resemblance method-wise to other things that have pre-existed, and it also relates to some newer things that are being promoted, like social design experiments or community design-based research. So, like there is a family resemblance to these things, and they foreground background different things. Um, happy to talk more about that during the Q and A. All right. So we're going to go through a few work examples just to give you a taste of the kind of work that we've been up to. 
Um, you know, I am hoping to learn from uh, you as well about like what you see in the work and what questions you have. So please queue up your questions for Q&A or for, um, after the, the session. I wanted to start by getting some of our curriculum work on the table. We're trying to create more expansive learning opportunities for youth. Um, we've done this historically. I, I was brought in to know how to do this at Berkeley, working in Marshall Lynn's lab in, in particular ways, but now we're thinking like across the system, like when you're working across the district, how to, how to do that work. Uh, this is a partnership um, that John Bransford's team at, the, at, at that point in time when we launched, uh, funded through NSF at the RK12, uh, and my team sank in to do together in partnership with um, the Bellevue School District. Uh, here you see uh, the basic model is to adapt existing commercial kits that the district has already adopted to make them a better fit for the vision. Um, and it's a, so it's a curriculum adaptation of commercial kit model to try to build on what we know about human learning to like shift the learning experiences in effective ways. This is a, a set of pictures from the uh, land and water kit for those of you who know this, elementary, fourth, fifth grade, depending on your district, it's about erosion deposition phenomena. You have a water table and you're running experiments on the water table with the dirt. Uh, it's really quite messy, fun for most, um, <laughs> but it has issues. Um, this was recontextualized to be uh, put into a, a problem based context around a community that has endemic flooding um, for particular reasons, and the design task is to figure out where to build new housing within that particular setting. There are three sites. You're kind of brought into that as a context um, for doing that work. Very much in the uh, uh, challenge based approach that uh, John Bracer and the team have done around Jasper Woodbury and other things historically. My group was bringing culturally relevant instruction in place, how to like, have kids become ethnographers of their own cultural lives in relation to the topics, and like figure out how to make connections between their everyday lives and the science phenomena that are in play. This, I think, basically just says what I just said, so I'm going to skip over it. Um, part of the opportunity is to get interest and identity in play in the science classroom. And, and sometimes people view that to be kind of a category error, that uh, interest-driven learning is something you do out of school, um, and we're really doing what we can to figure out how to make kind of school life attend to interest and identity. Um, there's a new uh, special issue of Journal, Journal of Learning Sciences that we just finished um, co-editing that went to press uh, this week. Um, around designing for equitable disciplinary identification. And there are kind of three school examples and one out of school example, trying to understand how you do that work. Um, and it's an interesting new space for us to think about uh, designing in relation to identity. This is the uh, hierarchical linear modeling uh, raw data um, from this particular study that came out of the district. Work. So we implemented with PD across a set of classrooms. Each row is a teacher. And so I'm going to pause and uh, let you talk with your neighbor about like what you see in the data in just a second. The top is the redesigned curriculum. We're designing for agency and relevance. And this is um, FOSS as, as authored by um, FOSS. Um, green is good. It shows <laughs> Red means unlearning. Uh, it's a loss. And uh, this is the, um, the science inquiry test. So these, uh, so it's not the conceptual inquiry test, but this is the science inquiry. What do they walk away knowing how to do around the practices? And so each of these is a particular dimension of an epistemic practice. And so turn to your neighbor, talk about what you see, and we'll come back together.
Um, so we bring the STEM professionals into a June event to highlight, like, this is how modeling looks in systems biology. Like, here's how, like, I use data analysis in forest science. Like, you know, so you do that work to help put uh, kind of a deep context around the practices in relation to contemporary science. And um, it's one of the powerful things that helps us launch. And then we sink into a five-day workshop where you're sinking into the details of a model that relates to a, a phenomenon you care about. You're thinking about language acquisition and ELL strategies for engagement, and then you're adapting the materials. It's done in small teams, and those teams often go in different directions. They do parallel design work to innovate in different ways of adapting the materials, and do improvement where they hand it off from teacher to teacher over the school year to do iterative cycles on the thing that they came up with as the modification. There are three release days. We tend to be analyzing student work, uh, formative assessment work, um, sometimes classroom video. Uh, we're learning and practicing new discourse strategies, doing some content knowledge pieces, and refining this curriculum. Researchers then are um, embedded throughout this work, and we kind of go in and um, have what we call deep dive partnerships with a subset of the teachers to do on the ground um, inquiry around problems of practice that come up and approaches that, that um, might help work on these problems. So I'm going to tell a story now of. Um, some of this work just to kind of make it a little bit concrete um, and real about like how these things unfold and you can think about how similar different this is from the work that you've done. So these are multi-component cognitive 3D assessments. That's the thing we're building to add to the infrastructure that the district can share. So a sequence of assessments that go with the adaptive units. Uh, the PI of the grant left, you've got a different job in the district. Um, Another project leader had a really major life thing, crisis go on, and was flying all over the country. Um, both events actually uh, introduced significant design tensions in the space, where somebody else was stepping in to take over the project that was a few years in, and um, had some major deliverables happening. Um, that new PI shows up in my office um, one evening, and um, basically says, Okay, so like in two weeks we have a release day and we need student work and we don't have student work coming from the classrooms that actually is a fit to what we're doing. Can you design some assessments that we can go out and use in classrooms and have student work in two weeks? I, I've learned not to say yes in a moment. <laughs> but then by the next morning I said yes. Um, and then we chased after it. Uh, we, I hadn't designed 3D assessments. At this point, I've done a lot of other cognitive assessment design in my graduate work and after. Um, we went back and we tried to figure out like how do we build our own capacity, um, build some version of 3D cognitive assessment quickly. Um, and so we started engaging in this process. We shared two work examples that were for the two units uh, that we were thinking about with our district folks. They worked with a disciplinary biologist who's part of the project to then round out the third came up with drafts of these assessment items that could then be piloted in classrooms and surface some student work that fit the 3D, the 3D model. Um, the teachers took it up, made them better, because they have actually, a lot of them have a, a kind of expert assessment design knowledge in one group in particular around ELL, and so they made the, the uh, assessments um, more useful in that way, and then we generated the student work products, the PD event. Part of then holding on to that equity piece is to say, okay, we're bumping into new work. We have to come up with this, you know, criteria for what makes a good assessment scenario. And so, like, um, I don't want to layer in all the words there. The first bullet, so it should work for students from non-dominant communities, and we've been kind of using that term and building a knowledge of, what, of who we meant in our particular schools around that term. Um, and if, if an assessment doesn't work for them, then it's not done in this development. We need to keep refining it. And so that has been the frame, and we've, we, the, um, the scenarios that get picked are often exclusionary for youth in non-dominant communities. That's one of those things like people infer that all kids have ridden a bicycle on the street and have been <laughs> stuck behind a bus. Turns out in one whole school they said our kids did not know what that meant. We had to go to a different scenario that actually was more uh, inclusive um, and relevant in their lives so they could solve that. Um, and that, this is just like undoing some of the complicated things that can happen through um, the assessment strategy. We also didn't know how to design assessments across the eight practices and the two practices that are most different for engineering. 
And, you know, that's a new thing for the field to learn. Uh, we were collaborating with Bill Penwell and his team, and we've been puzzling on the strategy. They had come up with this idea of task formats that basically at different levels of cognitive complexity give you a structure to think about designing an assessment item that ties to a practice. This is the modeling practice. And so, like, we worked together, and our team developed a third of them. They developed two thirds of them. Maybe draft is this tool that could be more broadly used to scaffold um, kind of the attention to that dimension in assessment task design. The, the partnership story here is that we had the resource in. We got an ask. It was a time critical ask. We didn't know how to do that work. We had an existing knowledge of other people doing related work. We could actually turn to them. They understood the time scale of our ask, and we helped find our way. Together. So as a partnership, we had to resource and expertise in that um, contingent way to try to meet the need that was popping up. Went to the district, engaged in work, and then we're figuring out like how do we actually make sense of the data that comes back. Um, in this particular situation, like we ended up coming up with a format where a teacher comes back with a batch of student work around one of the assessments. They get in a small table with stickies and they start flagging what Jim Minstrel um, helped us understand as facets of reasoning in 1989, these kind of patterned ways that people make sense of science-related <coughs> phenomena after they come on to do. And like we start surfacing the diversity of kids' ideas in this crowdsourced way around the table. And then we started realizing, oh, this is actually bumping up all sorts of issues around the pedagogical assumptions of people, like the right-wrong thinking, the misconception frame, the I should just say the idea clearer and more loudly. Like all these issues that came up when we stopped to actually sink in and say, why are we understanding the diversity of kids' ideas? Like what's the purpose here? And so we had to find our way through those conversations um, from room to room, basically. Um, but it allowed us to understand um, how to attend to the cultural variations of kids' ideas. And then the real work of teaching also layered on. It's like, well, we need some part of the infrastructure that's about, you know, a, uh, a reasonable way that teachers can actually learn from each other and have something that's actionable. So they started developing rubrics of different kinds where student facets are up on the left with examples, and then you have contingent moves that go and push on those ideas and those refined into a set of rubrics that are based on student ideas that tie to a, cat, a facet that has you know things that concern you about the facet or things you appreciate about that facet, and then like an instructional move that you can make in relation to. So they're trying to figure out like around this unit, here are the kinds of ideas that typically show up, here's what we like about them, what we're worried about, and how to push on them. We had the equity strategy um, around the ELL capacity building piece two, and then we realized like the assessment work needed to actually attend to that directly as well. So we started building tools around designing assessments that were more fair um, for multilingual students. Um, and that's just part of like coordinating the equity strategy across multiple initiatives that you're juggling um, within within the work. The collaboratory has a set of professional associations that we're partnered with. Um, so NSTA, the National Science Teacher Association, is one of those out of about ten, um, and we partner with them to figure out how to bring tools more broadly throughout um, science ed spaces. And so this is just a shot of one of the PDs where we do think that through these professional networks um, we should try to figure out like how to share what we learned in that one set of places in that district with the broader community um, and there's lots of online versions of this that we do and different things but like we are trying to engage more broadly which is part of the 13th state strategy too. So a couple of findings around this. Um, Shifts in leadership uh, within partnership can jeopardize the endeavor. This is a known problem. There tends to be high mobility within districts for different reasons. Um, faculty can pick up and move. Um, tends to be that like um, university folks have a little bit more of a stabilizing force within the work within districts compared to how things turn over. Um, but trusting relationships are central. So we had to have the trusting space where she could come to me and say, like, I have a problem that I need to fix in the next two weeks and that we needed to like step up into that space and understand the political consequences of us saying no um, and realizing that it's not something that we were gonna be able to, to manage and so we had to figure out how to do the new work. And um, as we think about like a design principle that's underneath this particular piece, it's about socializing. Like so Nicole Pinker took um, my one idea of socializing and said, oh no, it's more important than that. It's socialize, socialize, socialize. 
Like it's all about having trusting relationships so that when crazy emails show up that misrepresent the word, you're, they're not going to think that somehow it was a, you know you doing something to like you know behind their back that was sliding them. Like you just have to have that trusting relationship in place so that we can trouble our way through these crazy things that are bound to come up. I had one last night. I'm just telling you. Like um, got an email to a meeting and my main partner was not invited. And she should have been, but like whatever happened happened, and then I'm like I don't know what's going on there. Like you know, so it's one of those things. Infrastructuring can involve resourcing and new expertise. So it focuses on building this foundation for change. Um, and you're trying to take into account what's already happening, who's there, who has what expertise, and you're doing that through a network. Um, same time, like we had to bring in other expertise. So we need to actually make sure that we know what each other does and actually um, have those contacts so we can um, turn to each other and say, like, oh, I need test formats for practices. Like, you know, that's that. Kind of Alright, I'm going to try to get one more piece on the table and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, and it's about co-design as a central practice for improvement. Uh, Engstrom helps us understand that boundary crossing entails stepping into unfamiliar domains and that happens all the time in partnerships. Like you're wandering into a new space and you're understanding someone else's world and that's where you're working together to come to a new, understand, new way to understand concepts together to bring different um, disciplinary ways of knowing into focus and say, oh, that's what 3D assessment was. Um, he also, with his colleagues, has this idea of negotiated not working. So trying to understand the, um, the spindle of red fibers. Like, how do we characterize that as a system? Um, so they're rapidly pulsating, distributed, partially improvised orchestrations with people that are performing together but may not have been connected historically to it. So you're trying to like somehow characterize how do you do that work um, and come to do things that are interesting and new um, to improve the lives of kids. There are other framing issues that are important, and I'll just kind of highlight um, the bottom two. Design tensions, like sometimes designing is uh, framed as problem solving, when in fact actually in the work you can be understood as goal balancing. Uh, in coordination where there are just like complicated trade-offs um, from people who bring different ways of understanding uh, the design space together. The other is something that Megan might have talked about when she was here, although she published on 2015, so maybe she hadn't um, conceptualized that yet. And that has to do with um, understanding that the work itself can shift the value system of what's underneath it in a way that's productive in terms of equity. So that's, she's written about that as axiological innovation. And so the idea within our partnership so we take up an ELL focus as a frontline design focus, happened over a three-year period, and that's an axiological shift within partnership. Um, and we kind of need to understand how to design for that. Within our 13-state partnership, um, I won't sink into the details, we have an R&D process for coming up with the concepts, of the resources that we build from identifying them and designing and developing and publishing and revising them. And we're kind of going through this, this process iteratively. We've been studying the co-design practices themselves, of the researchers and the practitioners. In particular, we have existing resources where we're getting their critical feedback, and we're kind of, I'll show you some data today about like, what we're getting from that practice. We actually engage in collective ideation about like, okay, so if those are problems with existing resources, how do we design new things that we like better and do that together? And then we've been doing a new thing about rehearsing uh, resources with each other before we try to use them out in the world with people that we serve. Um, to give people safe spaces for learning. We are using formative assessment as the leverage point um, at this point to understand how to shift teacher noticing, curriculum materials, parent information about what science learning looks like, learner understanding what science is about. So it does have a, a, a promising um, quality to it that it actually does have a multi-dimensional impact on the system in ways that can help us think about coherence um, and equity. So like, we are kind of leaning heavily on formative assessment. We have two published OER resources today. These are 90 minute, two hour PD experiences that are built out with slides and talking notes and facilitator guides and resources. And those are being used pretty broadly. Um, we've been working with um, some of our state colleagues about like um, designing to build up capacity across their leadership network to then bring it to 6,000 teachers, for example. So we are like trying to figure out like, how to do kind of broader sharing of what we're up to. And then we have a new resource on um, 
cultural formative assessment, um, which I can talk more about. The data is basically like, so what do we get back? So we, we put up these resources and we ask state science people and their colleagues to give us feedback on how to make them better. The first time we did that, they suggested new things to add, even though they were very long already. But people basically have other things that they're trying to add in. Um, and then they wanted to think about like the implications for teacher learning. Like, kind of, they're worried about like what do teachers already know about that thing, and like they're kind of uh, thinking about that. We then brought them together in Nashville for a face-to-face -face meeting. We shared ideas about how they would, how they were already sharing the resources, or how they might. Um, we engaged them in rehearsal. Uh, Elham Kazmi and Maggie Lampert have this idea of like. Um, building out a routine where you simulate giving the instruction and then you get feedback in a constructive way with um, trusted others that help you, you know, work out your approach. And then we gave them the next resource and we got different feedback. So we got a lot more about a shared pedagogical approach. Like they, so we're starting to like have a collective concept come into focus saying like, how do we think about PD pedagogy together? And like the qualities of it that we can care across the 13 states. So like that's the leading category, and then we're then um, partnered to see the equity feedback becoming more substantial over time. So just to kind of pop up, um, I kind of already said this idea. So like the idea that we started getting these collective concepts in focus was big outcome. I'm going to jump through into the time to the second one, which is um, it's hard to like do the axiological shift within partnership, like to get people to attend to kind of values and um, particular uh, issues within um, kind of an equity frame together, uh, especially when you have 50 people in a room and you're trying to navigate that work. I think what we have seen in the work is that trying to make sure that equity is always in the leading edge of our project work opens a space for that to be more central. The cultural turn in the framework becomes a very generative space for people to connect to other things they've done in their previous life and map it into science ed. So they may have experience with culturally relevant instruction in ELA or in other parts of the like, courageous conversations or other things that they've done that now they find a way in to actually, we've seen people like say, oh, now I can actually connect my interest in equity like to science ed and I didn't know how to do that before. So we kind of see that shift happening within the network and that allows us to like think about um, how we engage and work together. We have to like create more volitional opt-in moments in order for that to happen and people start showing up to think with us in that direction. That's the design piece. Um, and we're still pursuing, pursuing that. Alright, I'm going to go to closer because I've been talking too long. And I'm just going to point you to new resources. So, um, on your way out, we have postcards for the Research Practice Partnership Toolkit. There's like three or four dozen tools for engaging in partnership at that website. And then we can also get one for the partner, the laboratory itself, although if you have this one, go land here, so it's probably not needed. Um, I gave you the one pager that we've developed to open up discussions about how to attend to equity within partnerships that might be of interest to you. We often like use this as a sense-making document as people are starting to come together in partnership. On the back, there's different ways of engaging in different parts of the discussion. How do you arrange for it? How do you record it, et cetera? So like that's just a pragmatic tool that um, helps guide the discussion. And I'll just kind of end by saying partnerships enable increased relevance of research for practice, builds um, trust for kind of seems to be more ambitious work to take on kind of um, more systemic inequities that are in play, um, supports mutualism in the work around the public practice and opportunity to practice um, and allows for a more nimble response. Um, Co-design itself can support this improvement project at scale. It becomes an inclusive frame where people bring their expertise and learn new things. And it opens up um, spaces for the, the equity shift that we care about. Um, the, the last bullet really just tries to summarize the idea that, yeah, professional relationships matter, personal relationships also matter. And so like, it really is important to kind of figure out like, how to like, do the cultivation of those trusted relationships so that you, you know, have each other on speed dial, basically, as needed. Because that does happen within the school context. I, um, I'm totally excited about this new book that came out in December. 
Angela Booker from the LCHC at San Diego is editor on that, along with Indigo, uh, as on the Boise. Basically, it's, you know, we have had a history of critical sociocultural theory within learning sciences, but there are many other theories we should be attending to, and they brought together a volume to think about what are the implications for design research from seven different theoretical perspectives, and it's a pretty fun, uh, fresh way of understanding kind of politics of learning and education. If you're interested in DBIR, the summer workshop, uh, third week of July, I think there's still slots open. Um, third, year, third year running. Spencer was the sponsor last year. I think they're sponsoring again this year. And then if you want to see a little bit more about our partnership work, we have a, a set of short stories written by our communication specialist describing different aspects of how we engage in the work. So with that, I will go to closure and we'll see what you want to happen. Thank you. So we have a little bit of time for questions. And um, I can stand and receive you, or you can raise your hand and go and call on Yes, um, How do we work with our local um, professionals that can help support our, our school as we move into the new NGSS practices and implement some of these tools that we talked about? So how to arrange for that? Yes, how to arrange. I mean, we are doing. Uh, so I'll say a couple things, but then other people in the room probably have very concrete, real things to say. Well, I, I think so. Um, researchers, we do basically PD for researchers around partnerships. There are versions of like what we do in a half-day format or an all-day format, which is about like just learning about a different mode of work than you might have come into as a researcher. So we do a lot of that work in the collaboratory just to help people understand and understand a different way of engaging in the work um, in that more engaged kind of responsive collaborative way um, so in we find a lot of uh, junior scholars being very interested a lot of more senior scholars also being interested like the tenure ladder like system professors tend to be a little bit more like yeah, I'm having to engage myself a little bit more carefully at that moment that kind of thing. so I'm a teacher yeah, please. So now we Yeah. And we are, so we are the practice. Yeah. We are the practice. Yeah. Um, and so I would like to know how do we get these researchers that are willing to get into our classrooms that we can collaborate with to make these improvements that we need to make. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I am going to kind of see if the room wants to speak to the room. You are my nearest neighbor. So, yeah. So, I mean, I... I'm, I'm going to ask if there's faculty here who have an answer that they want to provide. Um, well, I would say I'm Micah. I'm from UCSD Create. I'm the director of that organization. And we have a lot of work in partnership with teachers where we're trying to figure out um, how to pair scientists with teachers, how to do lesson study using male science. Catherine Schultz is here as the director of the San Diego Science Project, which is in CREATE. Uh, so we're, we're doing a lot of that work trying to figure out how to link our university and teachers and starting ongoing conversations with our colleagues here at State about that same question. you want to add anything, Catherine? No, I think uh, those opportunities are coming up more and more, so that's something to look for probably, and um, maybe create a website or like that. But we're doing it's sort of an emergency <coughs> with us, but we'd we like to have to just become more involved with that. So we match up researchers with. Well, I, I did work with, with the pre and work with the case program. Um, mm -hmm. kind of yeah. um, it's I'm just seeing more, more yeah. of that and mm -hmm. to make those connections and what is the avenue to to find those? I and mean, sometimes they're just a random. Yeah, that's the puzzle we're trying to figure out. That's right. Is how to move beyond the university, sort of spraying random outreach opportunities and whichever teachers hear about them, hear about them to, to more uh, sustained uh, efforts to create opportunities to learn for teachers. Um, so we're, we're uh, working on this very thing. <laughs> and I think there's a fair number of teachers in the area that are either working on a California NSC, so those have um, university, although there's some kind of issues now. Um, but California NSCs have brought a lot of university and 
together. Um, and then the NDSS or the Metro programs have as well. Um, and so we have a fair number of districts involved with those too. Um, opportunities like that uh, are nicely structured because they have that thing behind them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, but I, I don't, it's a good question. I don't know that we have a centralized way for teachers to know when those opportunities come up. Yeah. I mean, it tends to be communication out to people that we know. We need a better system. It also feels a little bit like uh, I'm old enough to remember when this person they called a full of brush man and said, your mom would sell you stuff. I don't even know what it was, but this person would come and sell you stuff. And it sounds a little bit like for many teachers, they have to wait for somebody to come to the door to sell them this thing that they're looking to buy. And, and, and you're asking a question about when a teacher needs or wants something, how do they go find it? How do they go get it? And I think that the difficulty in, in We've been talking about that at Crimson, Bill and I and others, about what role do we play in providing that to you? Should we be responsible for that? Should we be a clearinghouse of information? Should we collect your name and number and be aware when somebody's starting a new project? Should we connect you to somebody else? And then to, so I, I think these are difficult issues. I don't think we figured all this out. Because the way it tends to work now is somebody gets funding or starts a project, then they look for teachers to join their project, then they get the teachers, and then off they go. And that may not serve you. It's if not you are sustainable to, to be Right, that. right. And I, I think that, that, I think that, that we need to figure this out for the future because it's going to have to come from both directions. Exactly. I mean, I do think like the network of <coughs> teachers model it, it has some different qualities than a district model. Because we've been partnered with a district that is in opening up PD spaces for all middle school science teachers or all high school science, you know that. And then you're trying to figure out like how to navigate that to best effect. And, but it is different. Like we are kind of providing some technical assistance to research teams that are trying to pitch this kind of work too, because then it becomes much more of a practical thing where you have funding to engage in work um, in that way that Randy's talking about. It's like it's one strategy. It's, it's a very important question. Other thoughts or reactions? Um, before we take any more questions, let me quickly make an announcement about one more opportunity for those who are interested. I mentioned tomorrow at 3.30. We also have something happening tomorrow afternoon from 1.30 to 3. And Daniel, I'm going to let you say a word about Sounds it. Sounds great. So this is going to be a session on improvement science, um, which generally speaking is just a set of theories for sort of answering some of these questions about how, how do we improve and work with education on scale. Um, it's related to DBIR and some of the other things that Phil's talked about today. Um, so if you're interested in that conversation, please come down to Crimsey, join us, and we'll have a good chat about sort of grappling with some of those hard systemic problems and opportunities. And, and <laughs> it's like I have the same reaction to chat as a theory too, to focus on tension and you know, contradiction. Yeah. Also alignments that matter. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it's a little dispositional in me, like a round out. Yes. Um, so I think there's much work on to digital resources as a mode for accessibility because in low income areas or areas where it's too expensive to afford the insurance to take a bus to go look at the river, um, that digital resources, Google Maps, Google Earth might provide yeah. opportunities for the same sort of science learning that you can't get when you or that you get when you touch rocks and you go and you look at a broken right. down hillside. So, um. I mean, there's a lot of work to try to figure out like virtual simulations and how to productively design those and like what the trade off is. Like, there's been some studies that try to understand that. I, I mean, you're in the state that actually tried to go all in on OER curriculum resources. So, it's a little bit more of a question of like, so where are we at? Like, you know, I think that might be a question for other people in the room that know what. California Department of Ed has, has done, because I know they were trying to make that play. And just even more generally, um, digital resources as a facilitator of learning and interest, right. um, which is you know, the basis of science, at least for me, is that curiosity and question asking and answering questions and coming with ideas. So, yeah, if anybody has any resources or is doing any work on that, I'd be curious to know. Thomas Philip at UCLA has done a little bit of work on data science, and that was primarily on Thank you. And you're working on like fully online? Um, online or games, interactive media, 
Um, I know VR is out of the range of most people, but a lot of the schools up in the North State, little kids have Chromebooks, and so they do a lot of activities more on their own. Um, There's an NRC volume on games and simulations, I think, three or four years ago, too, that tried to distill what was known at that point. Okay. I, given the time, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you to thank Phil. Um, I'm going to be taking him next. I will keep him here for a little while. <laughs> yeah. If you'd like to come up and ask him uh, a couple more questions. But let's thank our speaker.